Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Denver Museum of Nature and Science at Home series. I'm Kristen Uhlenbrock. I work here at the Institute for Science and Policy, a project of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Really excited to be joining you this morning. So we've been bringing you this coronavirus or COVID series um, for a little over a month now. And so we've been really excited with all of you who keep tuning in and keep joining us back. And of course, we're extremely thankful to our partners, the Colorado School of Public Health, um, who've been really instrumental in helping us put this series together. So huge thank you to them. Um, if you've missed any of the previous episodes, we do have all of them recorded as well as written recaps. So you can always go back and read through something or watch something you maybe had another question about. Um, you can find all of that on our website. You can just go to institute.dmns.org and you can find all of that past recording material there on the website. So before we get started, just a couple housekeeping reminders as we always like to do. Um, we have two audiences joining us this morning. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, welcome. If you have questions on that platform, go ahead and type them into the comments feature and we'll pull them over into the Zoom feature as well. And then if you're joining us here on Zoom this morning, welcome to this platform and you can type your questions into the chat feature. Uh, we typically do about a 20 minute presentation or so and then we're gonna have hopefully a good 20 minutes to answer your questions. Feel free to keep them coming in along the way or wait to the end to type them in and we'll do our best to incorporate as many as possible into the end of the presentation today. So I hope you're excited as I am and you're sitting down with your cup of coffee or tea. We're gonna have a really wonderful presenter joining us today. Um, Dr. Alan Rudolph is the Vice President for Research from Colorado State University. Um, Dr. Rudolph is gonna be really talking about some of that cutting edge science and technology and the innovation happening kind of here in our own backyard, right here in the state of Colorado. Um, it's gonna be talking about how is this research really helping to advance and tackle this coronavirus and this pandemic going to take a holistic view of looking at that research enterprise. Dr. Um, Rudolph has had a really great career. Uh, he has been translating interdisciplinary life sciences into useful applications for biotechnology development for most of his career. Um, it spans everything from basic research to advanced development. He's worked both in academia, government laboratories, and of course the nonprofit and private sector. So he's pretty much done it all in essence. Um, he's extremely well published um, in addition to his illustrious career. I can't go through all of it, but a few highlights include he worked at the Naval Research Laboratory. He worked for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency or also known as DARPA for those of you who are good with acronyms. Um, he was also the CEO of AdLife, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is a diagnostic platform company. And he's even started an international nonprofit focused on brain stem efforts in clinical trial management in underserved populations. Um, he's received numerous awards, and of course, we're really excited to be having the Vice President for Research joining us today from Colorado State University. With that, let me turn this over to Alan and say good morning and welcome. Good morning. Thank you very much for that introduction and it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to your audience. Um, I guess I'll uh, start sharing my content, hopefully, or that will be done for me. There we go, thank you. <coughs> well, looks like the last slide. We'll start with the first slide. I can do that. Or you could get me to the first slide. Thanks for that introduction. Um, you know, what I'd like to do today is give you a little bit of my experience. It seems like this uh, issue of outbreaks and pandemics has been chasing me my whole career. Uh, I started in this uh, area 25 years ago in 1995 um, at uh, DARPA, as you heard. I mean, I came out of the Naval Research Lab. I'm a zoologist by training. I got my PhD at UC Davis. And started actually in in uh, the earliest days in one of the first outbreaks in HIV and worked on artificial blood for the Navy. So my whole career started in an outbreak. I went to DARPA at 95, in 95, about the time we were being uh, debriefed about uh, the first issues associated with biodefense. And so my experience with this issue of pandemics actually starts, unfortunately, with the offensive use of biological pathogens. And you see at the top of the screen here a picture of Stepnodogorsk, which was an anthrax production facility in the 80s that the Soviets had built 
in their response to uh, the Star Wars defense initiative by the Reagan administration, they had no missile defense. So they uh, were a very active in a very large program of 30,000 people dedicated to weaponizing pathogens and loading, fortunately loading missile heads with kilogram quantities of anthrax. That knowledge in the 80s and early 90s when I went to DARPA really started a very significant investment in uh, preparing for pandemics. In this case, concerned about the adversarial intent of those pandemics. But many of the things as we'll see in the presentation that we would do uh, in preparation for a adversarial use of weapons is the same we would do when nature is the terrorist. And so, you know, we often talk about a war on disease, whether it's a war on cancer. I mean, there, there are very significant analogies you'll see throughout the presentation about how uh, we've used the wartime jargon, the wartime approach to fighting disease. And it's very much the case that, that we're in now. Uh, my path out of DARPA after getting a business degree, I actually started companies that serve uh, pandemic product spaces. So Cellfire is a company that has freeze-dried blood uh, platelets, which are uh, many of the pathogens elicit bleeding injuries. And AdLife is a diagnostic company that's focused on outbreaks, in this case, around chronic wasting diseases or diseases like mad cow disease. So we have agricultural outbreaks as well as human ones that we've seen in the last 20, 25 years. And in fact, the former Soviet Union was working on pathogens, not only for humans, but to take down the agricultural sector of the US. And there's a great Pulitzer Prize book, if you want to read it, called The Dead Hand, up there on the left of that picture. I recommend that book highly. It's a great story of uh, how uh, the offensive biological program was dealt with. Um, I came back in the Obama administration and ran the country's uh, biochem, uh, bio biological defense, chemical defense programs for the DOD and then Homeland Security before coming to Colorado State in 2013. And you can see this timeline on the right of a number of things that happened, everything from 95, the publication of a book called The Hot Zone, you may remember from Richard Preston described an accident in the Hazleton labs around Ebola. So we've seen an increasing both uh, pathogen presence from threats, both from adversarial intent, accidents, and of course, mother nature. And uh, this teaches us many things that we'll talk about. One of the things that it's taught us is that these problems are not unique to humans. This is really a one health problem. And there's a lot more discussion now and we get to the end of the presentation, you'll hear I'm gonna refer back to the one health infrastructure because we cannot solve these problems simply by dealing with the human aspects of disease. The interconnectedness of animals and humans, the environment and climate, issues around water and air quality, the uh, distribution of rural and, and urban assets, all of these things contribute to how emerging threats have both increased in frequency and in severity. So it's really outbreaks occurring as a result of ecosystem disruptions. And we're understanding more and more about that and in fact, the, the presence of new legislation to try to prepare us for outbreak resiliency is really focused on this One Health infrastructure. The real challenge of the day from scientific discovery has been and will continue to be to understand how, in one case, is zoonotic channels. This is a term that's referred to. How do these uh, diseases jump from animals into humans? And you can see a number of pictures here. These are actually pictures uh, from Fort Collins where we do actually work with a lot of these animals. So you may know that camels were a reservoir for Middle Eastern respiratory syndrome, another SARS virus. The bat and the pangolin are thought to be, the pangolin there is in the middle, uh, is thought to be uh, perhaps the origins of the current COVID uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2. And uh, there is also reports in the literature of the, of the domestic cat being a reservoir, can carry the virus, can transmit the virus from cat to cat. And so this question of what leads to these viruses jumping from animals to human hosts, and what is it about the host and pathogen dynamics as they change to enable that jump or to enable the resistance of a host to uh, that jump? These are really important questions and really important investments the country's making to understand these questions, and they will be enabling in the future to better understand this uh, kind of situation of zoonotic jump. 
I want to talk about this uh, diagnostic testing as a big component of what we're doing in, uh, across the state, and certainly uh, at CSU to look at how we're leveraging strengths across this one health landscape. We've created two CLIA certified testing sites I want to talk a little bit about um, because all of us are focused on testing in, in some sense or another, whether it's RT-PCR, serology, or even wastewater testing now, which is starting to uh, show its face on the, across the state as a way for early warning. Why? Because diagnostic testing and biosurveillance is our first line of defense. It is our first opportunity to detect that there's a, a, a new emerging virus in the area, a flare up of continuing chronic diseases that we see regularly. And so biosurveillance and, and diagnostic screening are very, very important part of our armament in defending against emerging threats, whether they come from adversaries or from nature. I'm going to skip this slide and come back to it. it. Looks like this is a build slide, so let's see if I can do that. So I want to talk a little bit about biosurveillance in the senior care facilities. As you know, this is the highest channel of mortality in the state, with our most uh, significantly uh, underserved population in terms of li li liabilities disease. We know the aging community has a, a greater incidence of underlying health conditions that can lead to higher incidences of morbidity and mortality. And in fact, as you can see, the majority of deaths in Colorado are associated with skilled nursing facilities. Um, most of the surveillance in the state is still focused on uh, screening workers for symptoms uh, and, and involving uh, symptom tracking. And that's a really important piece. We know fever and cough are an early symptom. We also know loss of taste and smell. But we also know that this virus is uh, active and can be con uh, tr transmitted from person to person even before somebody's symptomatic. And so it's really important uh, to be able to uh, screen for those who aren't showing symptoms but may be positive to the virus so that they can't transmit it to the residents of that nursing care facility. And that's a program we started actually back in February, a pilot program with the state uh, that has recently been expanded. And so, um, as you know, diagnostic testing is widening. It's largely been limited to symptomatic individuals. Now we're seeing more wider testing availability in the state, even for asymptomatic individuals. I know a lot of the people involved in the protests in the city are being offered free testing out at the Pepsi Center. So we are, uh, I think, waking up to the fact that this asymptomatic population is a really important population to be screening. And in fact, uh, the data shows that that's very much the case because 13% of the asymptomatic uh, workers that we've tested in five facilities in Larimer County, um, we're now expanding this to over 40 facilities across the state. About 13% of those workers who didn't show symptoms were positive for SARS-CoV-2 or for the virus that causes COVID. And so we were able to remove those people as they've been tested for positive, even if they were asymptomatic, we've removed them from the workforce population and increased the health of the nursing care uh, residents in those facilities. And you can see the number of people being tested uh, and the number of people positive. 13% was the average, but at times you could get a spike in a facility as much as 20%. And these are uh, longitudinally sampled. So we're sampling these workforce once a week, which is another very important aspect of, uh, of, of uh, screening is that the viral doubling time is about six or five or six days. And so once you screen asymptomatically, you have to keep screening asymptomatically. And that's what we're doing. So if I can advance this. 80% um, remain in some asymptomatic during that uh, eight week period. Now we're extending that period. And of course, the new incident infections decreased over time because we're isolating positive workers and not letting them back into the workforce, which means that we're saving morbidity and potential mortality in these facilities. And as you may have seen uh, last week or so, the governor announced the expansion of this screening. We'll be doing it across 25 facilities in close consort with the state. And this is a really important program, and we hope that it can be extended as it has been to other workforces. We're doing so with the agricultural sector, with other sectors, because this kind of asymptomatic screening is, in fact, 
what's needed to sustain a workforce and to prevent uh, further contagion in those that are working in senior care facilities or other places where contagion uh, needs to be contained. I want to talk about another program we've been engaged with uh, with the state across uh, PPE. Um, as we know, uh, the masks and the gowns and the plastic shields, all of these are really critical aspects of protecting workers who are both serving COVID um, in healthcare facilities, serving those with virus in healthcare facilities. In our own case, we uh, maintain a very vibrant uh, use of PPEs because we have a very large infectious disease research program with a lot of biocontainment that requires this kind of protection. And so we were prepared to support the state with uh, this kind of testing, testing to ensure that masks that the state of Colorado acquires, especially from China, actually meet the standards that are required for protecting workers who use these masks from the virus. And so there are uh, mask testing. You can see some of the equipment in the picture here. These tests really um, determine the filtration properties of the mask. So the virus is very small and, and uh, these masks essentially provide filters to filter out the virus from penetrating that mask and, uh, and being exposed to a person's respiratory system. And so our testing is really all about, is that filtration intact? Is the mask performing to the specifications on the box? And you would say, well, why would we have to test uh, specifications from a commercial purveyor? Well, you may have heard that many of the masks sent to us from China did not meet the specifications. And so this was essentially, again, looking at, uh, at this kind of activity of biosecurity through the national security lens. So we wanted to ensure that the acquisitions of out-of-state uh, PPE, N95 masks, surgical masks, gowns, plastic shields, uh, met requirements. We also wanted to help Colorado manufacturers produce these PPEs up to standard. So we've been doing that and we uh, have been using the, the uh, compliance of NIOSH, that's the, the National Institute of Occupational Safety that uh, sets these standards and we uh, have all the equipment and compliance to do that and we've been looking at the supply from international and domestic uh, suppliers and qualifying those masks. Um, for the state of Colorado, they send us masks, we qualify them, they then release them. And now the inventories of masks are pretty good across the state of the Colorado. We've tested over 75 masks uh, for their properties, both new designs as well as uh, commercial ones. And we've also established decontamination methods for these PPEs because sustaining the supply will not only require finding uh, logistic supply chains that are intact, but also enable us to reuse masks. And so you can use a number of techniques, both thermal and chemical, to uh, essentially regentrify an N95 mask for many uses. And that extends our supply considerably. I wanna talk about uh, the medical countermeasures. Okay, so uh, diagnostics and surveillance screening is your first line. Uh, once you know uh, an emerging or a chronic flare up is coming your way in outbreaks, you need to be able to produce countermeasures uh, agilely and, and in, in very uh, specifically for the disease at hand. And that requires, of course, regulatory concerns, a number of things that um, people have to go through in order to qualify these products. Um, we are in a very unique situation because we have four vaccine candidates uh, at Colorado State in development. And I'd like to tell you about our most mature candidate, Solovax. So this is a, a, a really uh, interesting and I think near-term opportunity, both for the state, the nation, and the world to produce a vaccine that is based on an existing manufacturing platform made by a company in Colorado called Terumo BCT. You see that manufactured uh, product on the left. It's a pathogen reduction technology that's used to remove pathogens. In fact, it's used to remove SARS-CoV-2 from blood in Europe, Asia, Africa. It's been approved for use and it's being used. And we use the same device, which uses light and vitamin B2 or riboflavin to inactivate the virus. So the virus can no longer replicate, but the surface of the virus is a potent immunogen and can be used as a vaccine. 
because it has a manufacturing platform, because it's already used in blood transfusion commercially, this is a very fast track for both regulatory, it's a known for human safety product. Um, we just received funding from NIH to take this all the way through human clinical trials, which is about a $30 million effort. So we'll be moving very quickly. And this is a very exciting opportunity for us and for the state and for the region to very rapidly produce a vaccine. We have three other vaccine candidates that are also in play being supported by uh, internally now and waiting for NIH funds. One or two of those vaccines are also available for cats. And we'll come back to that because it may be that the solution, the resilient solution to ending a, a SARS-like pandemic in the US, not only is a vaccine for humans, but to stop the animal channels of spread as well and put the animal vaccines. And so we're, we're prepared and we're, we're uh, actually active in both cases. Now, what allows us to do that is the presence of our Biomark. And some of you may know about this facility, but it's a very unique facility in Fort Collins on the west side of our campus. It's an FDA approved, good quality manufacturing facility. So it makes products already it won the Colorado Manufacturing Award in 2019. It has 50,000 square feet of biosafety level three manufacturing space. So we're very uniquely situated in Colorado and the region to have a manufacturing facility capable of, of producing this commercial vaccine. Let's talk just for a few minutes and end this uh, discussion and take your questions on what the future looks like. And really, these are words that I think you're going to be hearing more about as we do the after action reports and start to work on how do we prevent this from happening again. Now, I know we're still in the middle of this pandemic, and it's hard to think about that as we're all still mostly in our houses waiting for society to reopen. But this is a very important aspect of investing in our future. And so I'd like to come back to this issue of biosurveillance because uh, my experience with the DOD. We worked on uh, essentially agile and resilient technologies to bring forward that allow you to essentially find an emerging disease like COVID before it happens. And we often refer to this, the first Defense Sciences Board study we did on defending the homeland for biological threats in 2001 was entitled looking for a zebra in a herd of horses, because that's essentially what you're doing before you have a pandemic is you're looking for an emerging virus you didn't know you had. And so you can't be testing uh, for singular pathogens all the time. You have to test against syndromes. So syndromic screening is our future where we'll be having fevers of unknown origin. We need to screen against a number of pathogens or respiratory diseases. We can't tell in flu season whether somebody has flu or COVID. So we're gonna need to screen against a whole series of pathogens at once. That's called multiplexing, and we have it now, and you see the evolution from 1998 in a company called Idaho Technologies that we st first started investing in almost 20 or more years ago. And today on the right, a small desktop unit from BioFire that can test 21 to 35 pathogens in one test, including COVID, but cover a whole series of pathogens for fever or respiratory disease. And this will be our future. We can no longer be looking for individual pathogens. We need to be screening for syndromes and trying to find, are we seeing something new that really requires us to move quickly to prevent the same kind of pandemic we see today? We also need to look at our data and data uh, sharing, data integration, and data analytics. So a, uh, artificial intelligence and machine language are kind of the buzzwords of today but they really are about predictive analytics and our data sharing across health channels. Colorado is very uniquely sit situated with strong health information exchanges on the human side, linking those to animal uh, healthcare data, to environmental healthcare data will be really critical in communicating around a threat that is emerging. And that's an opportunity right in front of us. On the right, you see data that predictive analytics is already helping us and predict, for example, who's going to get sick from COVID if we look at the host. So if you look at human health and all the genes that you express to any disease in immunology, in any pathogen that you may see, can we predict that you're seeing something new 
or that you're getting flu or that you might get sick. And it turns out, yes, we're getting better at those kinds of predictions as well. One of the things that we have to face is the emergency use authorization. This is a term that actually does come out of uh, wartime. And uh, we know that when we're in a pandemic, we've seen uh, the FDA act in unusual ways uh, using this EUA or emergency use authorization. This is of course required to give us agility. It's a very limited use authority. It's been used by DOD in conflicts, but quite frankly, in the, in the last series of conflicts, there's been a trend not to use EOA, EUA, to not use war fighters, essentially as uh, you know, first time experiencers of a new drug or a medicine. Yet we saw this and we continue to see this during COVID. It's brought innovations forward but it's also brought a lot of confusion about what works well. And so I think you're bound to see some regulatory innovations and regulatory changes as a result of COVID that'll be important in moving things forward, but also moving things forward in a way we know how they work. Let me end there and thank you for your attention. There was a lot more I could have said about this uh, current situation. I hope you're all dealing with it well, and I look forward to answering any questions you might have. So thanks for your time. Thank you, Dr. Rudolph. Um, lots of information there. Uh, so I think we're going to have to hopefully try to get to as many of these questions as possible um, and unpack some of it. So it may be a little back and forth, a little haphazard um, with the direction we take, but we will try. Maybe we can end with the last slide you had right there about emergency use authorization. Could you just explain um, as, as simply as possible um, what that actually means? Yeah. So, you know, as we know, the Food and Drug Administration's primary role is safety of products that are moved into human health uh, indications. They operate in a very uh, re uh, regimented way. Um, for those, you know, who've joined us, who put products into, uh, into the marketplace through the FDA, we know it's a long process. We've heard for drugs, it can take 10 to 12 years. For vaccines, it's even harder. Um, so there's safety considerations and then there's efficacy consideration. Emergency use authorization is a set of authorizations that says during essentially an emergency, and it was mostly created around wartime, that the acceleration of the regulatory process can occur. And so they allow you to, to change the rules essentially to move fast. Um, so let me give you an example. In a diagnostic test that's approved by the FDA normally, you would have to test that against uh, a lot of uh, clinical samples. Uh, let's say you had a product for the first uh, SARS disease. You would have to have a number of samples to test against. Well, in the, in the current outbreak, it took a while. We don't even have a number of clinical samples to test these products against. So they allowed you to spike in the virus into, into normal samples in order to have that product approved. So they changed the rules to allow it to happen faster. Um, and they allowed products to come to market quicker. So it's a, it's a, a very unusual authorization that's only um, granted during emergencies. And it essentially sort of throws the rules into a new set of agility and, and a set of rules that can allow products to come forward. Um, as a result, things coming forward faster aren't as hard and tried true tested in the market. And so we have a number of questions about ultimate accuracy of these tests, as an example. If not, what do they tell you about COVID disease just because we haven't had the usual experience that we have with these products going through the FDA? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's um, been some reporting recently, too, just about on this about um, some relationship with kind of big data products coming out of the private sector being used in um, publications that have had to been retracted. Um, so there's a lot of challenges in some of this moving really quickly as we need to with the coronavirus in the research world. Um, could you speak a little bit to that? Like what are some of the risks with both fast tracking certain research? What are some of the risks with trying to fast track a development of a vaccine? Yeah, I mean, you know, what's really, I think all of us recognize, especially your audience, is that this is a, a tremendous window where science has to, had to meet implementation before we understood 
uh, a great deal about this virus, and we're still learning a great deal about this virus. Um, so, you know, in other cases, we're often moving products in areas with diseases or pathogens that we know a lot about, dengue, flu, malaria. But here we have a, a, a pathogen and a virus that we are still learning a lot about. So what does that mean? It means we have publications that are not peer reviewed in the same way that w with people reviewing them who don't have the experience with the virus that they would normally have. And so you have a lot, as you point out, on the hydroxychloroquine studies, uh, you have a lot of peer reviewed data getting out or so-called peer reviewed publications getting out and then being called into question as time goes on, either for the data sources or were they too quickly published before they had a chance to really understand all of the data. So, you know, we have a number of things like that, but FDA acceleration, peer review acceleration, and we're trying to keep up with understanding the virus as well as implementing practices and policies that best protect us as we are learning. And that presents a lot of challenges for determining what works well, when should we use it, um, and how will we learn about it over time that better informs us. Yes, thank you. It's, it's, it's a huge open-ended question, um, and I think a, a challenge. And I, I've been saying the coronavirus really is a really good example of seeing science intersect with policy, and it's happening and unfolding um, in real time right now. So the scientific process, of course, is sometimes slower than what sometimes is needed, right, to help with public health and public safety. So it's a really interesting, I think we could probably spend a whole hour, if not more, talking about that. Um, but we do have a lot of like nuts and bolts questions. So I wanna try to get to some of those and then maybe we can go back to big picture. Um, and Ellen, if you can't answer some of these, it's, it's okay. But we have a number of questions about masks. Um, you did bring up PPE, right, and the N95 mask, and, you know, there's really uh, more stringent safety masks that are needed for um, our medical workers and other frontline personnel. Um, but for those individuals, right, that aren't in those positions, that are wearing homemade masks or potentially ordering some masks online, how do they know? They want to know how how effective are they, right? How effective are their homemade masks? And, you know, the disposable masks, are they meeting standards to help keep the average person safe? Yeah, that's a great question. So if you if you look at the testing of masks and you hold up an N95, the reason it's called an N95, it's it's um, preventing 95 or more percentage of those particles from uh, viral particles from transiting across that mask. And as you go down into cloth masks, of course, that percentage drops precipitously. So they do offer some minimal protection in terms of projecting uh, excellence or if you're coughing or sneezing um, and they do present prevent the plumes of an excellent from getting much farther but uh, the actual viral penetration of the mask um, is still you know it, it offers a very low percentage of actual viral uh, filtering but it does prevent sort of the plumes of excellence coming out and you know this is kind of what we're learning uh, when we were in defense or homeland security, we we're of course worried about plumes of large pathogens, uh, perhaps, but now we're learning a lot about, you know, what when, when somebody exhales in a room, how, where does it go and how long does it take to get there? And that's actually a lot of very interesting physics that's pretty hard um, and it's pretty hard to predict. But those masks, those cloth masks do a great job. And if you've ever seen some of those nice particle flow videos, with a cloth mask, you're actually reducing the amount of excellent projection from an individual. So in that case, they are providing uh, some good protection as we go out into public, maintain our social distancing, and use those cloth masks to prevent any of that plume from reaching somebody. Great, thank you. Um, you brought up a slide that was talking a little bit about biosurveillance, right? And, and thinking about the transmission between animals and humans and trying to have this really big holistic picture so as we think about being prepared for the future. There has been some talk about developing a kind of global program um, based in genomics to try to think about intersecting pandemic. Um, could you talk a little bit more about what that is and, and how that would potentially work? Yeah, so actually the, um, the Defense Department has had this for a while. There's a global epidemic, uh, ep epidemiological surveillance system program called GEIS. And why? Because they have uh, 
thousands of, of men and women uh, wearing our uniform in uh, tropical parts of the world, uh, in Asia, um, at the equator, in Africa, who are exposed to uh, outbreaks all the time. And, and so um, there has been a significant investment in global surveillance of disease uh, in, in our health national security programs. That's been fortified by programs like USAID, by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, the non Luger policies that were uh, created around nuclear threat reduction. Those surveillance systems have been invested in by those programs, the non Luger programs in the State Department and the Defense Department to build up health capacity around the world in, in ways to make it safer to these outbreaks. And part of that was to in, introduce surveillance systems. So we, we will very likely see a, a stronger investment in that in the US. Now we've had an investment in some of that in a program called BioWatch, which is in city, major cities of the US which is air sampling for uh, major pathogens of concern. But this has to be greatly expanded. It has to be inculcated into our very state and regional systems. And we have those systems. They're just not linked together in any kind of integrated way. Now, on the genomic side, to your point, there's been a program uh, called PREDICT out of USAID, which has essentially been, for the last 10 years, to the tune of hundreds of million dollars of going around the world sequencing all the new emerging pathogens they can find. And there has been a proposal made in Washington uh, in kind of a moonshot, this was actually pre-pandemically, uh, to sequence all the nasty viruses that we know about. That's about a $4 billion price tag. And there are those who claim that that will provide the foundation from which to predict um, when we see something new. That's great. Um, Alan, I also know you wear the hat. I think you're the chair of the CoLabs Consortium, which is a, a, a state-based uh, consortium. I think it's over 30, you're probably gonna get that right, um, of our kind of national research labs here in the state of Colorado. How does Colorado compare uh, with some of our regional neighbors when it comes in terms of some of the work we're doing with COVID-19, as well as just kind of research in general? Yeah, so uh, thanks for that. And uh, I am the chair of CoLabs. CoLabs is, as you say, uh, the, the front range is very unusual in having this engine of national labs, as you pointed out, over 30, contributing about $4 billion of economic development to the state. But more importantly, a real intellectual and translatable asset for the state and will play a very important role for our region in, in building that resilience capacity for future outbreaks. And the ecosystem that we have with Colorado Biosciences Association, um, with the, the federal labs, really positions us quite well to even consider something like a new national lab for outbreak research and response. And there's some discussion going on, on in that vein. So we have CDC on our campus. We, we produce in that Biomark facility, commercial diagnostic kits for CDC. We have large pharmaceutical companies, large animal health companies in that manufacturing plant. Across the state of Colorado, we really have an ecosystem of innovation that's well poised to build health resilience. Um, the, the health information exchange I mentioned. And so I think this integration of uh, public and private sector will be a really important building uh, blocks for us to start to position this region now, Colorado compared to our Western region is also very well positioned because of those national labs, because of the health of our economy uh, pre-pandemically, I think we're gonna return to a position of some prominence in this. In one case, we've been leading a coalition on the agricultural outbreak side with our Western states and, and getting a lot of momentum. As you know, before COVID, there was an African swine fever outbreak where there was a pig pandemic where half the pigs in China were lost and a significant loss in world global protein as a result. So these outbreaks are unfortunately not just in the human channel and the region is really well suited to lead. Thank you. I think being resilient is really important and being prepared as well as of course having a really strong response when things like this happen. What are some of your recommendations um, for us to be more resilient and more prepared in the future? 
So uh, one of the things that I think this has taught us and, and uh, having spent 25 years in both investing and executing R&D to prevent an outbreak is that uh, we can have all the things we need on the shelf, but if we don't know how to implement them, or we don't know how to work across sectors to build that resilience, uh, we won't be successful. So it's, it's really as much the social cultural underpinnings of recognizing health resilience as an important component of our society. And I think the pandemic has shown us that. I mean, the ripples through our society of, of economic loss, of health loss, we've lost more people than we've lost in wars. This is really going to give us a window of opportunity to transform our thinking and our society about health resilience. But that's going to be cultural. It's going to be social and cultural because we have the technology, we have the diagnostics, we have the therapeutics. We didn't implement them in time and we need to do better. And I think this resilience of thinking about how not just let's not prepare for the next outbreak. We can't have a one bug, one bill approach. We really need to build resilience in new ways so that we invest in host response. So humans are better prepared for the next pathogen and we're really building immunity from the host, not focusing on the pathogen. We need to build syndromic surveillance so that we're not looking for one bug, that we've got multiplex opportunities to look for it. And we need FDA to, to lean into approving drugs and countermeasures that have multiple indications. The whole system is designed to write on the label, tell me what it's specifically used for. But we actually need things that are used for multiple uh, threats. And so, you know, getting uh, off-label or more, more label indications onto some drugs will be another way to build health resilience. And all of that comes through, a, I think, a social and cultural understanding of the importance of doing this to prevent the kind of results we've seen in the last three months. That's great. I think I want to wrap up with one question that just builds on that, which is, I think you've got a really good perspective, both from your career and where you currently sit, into that translation of you know, basic research all the way into the application and, you know, in use out in the field. Um, what are some of your hopes on how we can do this a little bit better, how we can do it a little bit faster? You know what I mean? What are some of those hindrances and roadblocks? What are some of those opportunities in that translation of getting something out of the lab into real world use and application? Yeah, one of the problems used to be that um, uh, stockpiling is not, you know, in other words, if you treat this like a, a a hurricane coming at you and you stockpile a bunch of things and then you deploy them and then you stockpile again. That, that's really not a sustainable model. We have to make it so that we're investing in these things uh, continually, that it's built into the very fabric of our society. And so agility and resilience, I mean, the agility is going to come through, I think, technology. We do have better ways to make faster vaccines. I mean, I think, you know, even the newer strategies in that case, like Moderna, where we're giving a message to a body to make that vaccine is a very agile, quick way to do it once we get over the safety of that kind of strategy. So we'll have strategies that allow us to move quicker, but we need markets, capitalization and social structures to understand that this is a really important investment that we all need to make into the fabric of our society, not something that we're making for that uh, category five you know, threat that we expect once every hundred years. What we've learned in the last 20 years is the frequency of these threats are increasing. Our countermeasures like antibiotics and antivirals are in need of real uh, reforms. And so we, we do need to sort of take that agility and start to invest in it in a very serious way. Great, thank you. I think that's a, a nice note to end on, um, Dr. Rudolph. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you to everyone who tuned in, both here on Zoom and Facebook. We really appreciate your time here on Monday morning. Um, we're in the works and planning next week's program, um, so stay tuned from that. We will be sending information out as that comes together this week very soon um, about what to expect in our speakers for next Monday. Um, we really are trying to make this series useful for you. So I think we may try to send out a poll here soon again, just to get your input on kind of the topics and speakers and the timing of everything you want to hear about. So we can kind of keep this very relevant and timely and vibrant. 
Um, if you're not on our mailing list, you can find that on the Institute's website. That's the best way to stay up to, uh, up to date on everything we have going on and coming out um, from the Institute and, of course, the museum as well. You can also follow us on our social media channels on Twitter. We're at Institute Sci Paul. The museum is at Denver Museum NS, and our colleagues at the School of Public Health are at Colorado SPH. Um, thank you again to our partners at the School of Public Health and all of my museum colleagues uh, for helping put this together. Um, it definitely takes a lot of arms behind the scenes to make this happen. I'm very appreciative um, to all of them. Uh, so thank you. I wish you all have a wonderful rest of your week uh, filled with both compassion and kindness. Thank you for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you again.